How does a kid from Missouri end up being an Alaskan hunting guide? Caleb Stillians has done just that. And in this episode, we talked about how he made that transition, how the backcountry can humble you in an instant and provide you with an entire new outlook on life. Caleb also talks about his belief that we can get a lot done, but you have to be willing to prioritize and then be willing to do it. This is the No Excuse to Miss podcast. Welcome to the No Excuse to Miss podcast. I am your host, Scott Volkortson, and this week's guest is Caleb Stillians. Caleb is the founder and host of Rise Up. He's an Alaskan guide, and as his website states, he's just somebody that's trying to simply be better today than yesterday. How are you doing, Caleb? I'm doing very good, Mr. Scott. How are you doing? I am good. Thank you for taking the time to do this. No, thank you for having me. It's a true pleasure. So I want to get into everything you're doing with the guiding and the hunting, but first give us a little background of like what the rise, what rise up is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so I think it started originally back when I, I was homeschooled for the longest time. And then I went to public school back when I was a uh, junior and senior year, because I wanted to be a Navy SEAL at that point in time in my life. I decided not to go down that route for various reasons. And I, it was weird because I, I went in the class in a junior year in Missouri. That's when you take your ACT. And I was sitting there and I was watching all my co-students, I guess is what you'd call it, heroes. And they were like, okay, I got to get a 19 to get into this college. I got to get uh, a 21 to get into this college. And it was, it was a real dynamic to watch everyone shoot for that bare minimum that they had to get to get into that college. And I'm sitting there like... What's the perfect score on this thing? And that oh, it's thirty six because you know I'm a homeschooled. I didn't even realize all this stuff, and I'm uh, like thirty six. I'm like, so shouldn't everyone be shooting for like a a thirty six? <laughs> like you know, you shoot, you shoot for perfection, and wherever that yeah. ball hits, that's where it hits, I guess. So uh, that's where that uh, idea started, and it wasn't rise up at that point in time. It was just like, why are people shooting shooting for average? And it didn't make sense to me. And then fast forward along uh i grew up watching hunting shows that's how i i taught myself to hunt by watching hunting shows and going out into the woods by myself no one in my family hunts so uh i, I always wanted to, to start some type of production i remember watching like roy rogers john wayne as a kid and thinking about how much of an impact that was to me so i'm like i really want to try to start producing films and uh, i was sitting on a mountain uh bear hunting and i got stuck out there for like 28 days straight didn't have a shower didn't have nothing uh the it was just an interest i was working for an interesting individual we leave it at that uh that maybe wasn't quite as squared away as he should have been so i got back and i, I how was old were you when this happened uh it wasn't that long ago i was 22 so okay. it was, yeah two and a half years ago so yeah old man <laughs> but uh <laughs> i got back to town after that uh fiasco and i'm sitting there drawing and that the three the little binder books that i was telling you about and i i drew this guy climbing a mountain in a sun rising up behind it, and that's a, the logo for rise up and the, the idea behind it is that that guy's done got up before the sun got up and is at the top of the mountain already and that's the kind of effort you have to be willing to, to put in to to be excellent at anything is the, the kind of the drive and tenacity to i don't care that it's dark outside i don't care that i'm cold and i'm wet i have this goal in mind whatever that goal is i'm gonna accomplish it and then the rise up's kind of got a double meaning of like trying to help people as well because it's not just all about yourself uh i have a little saying it's cool to be a lone wolf until you run into a bear because the, <laughs> the bear gets a hold of that wolf he's in trouble if he's got a pack they can kind of bite him on the ass and distract him uh so it's uh it's i've seen that happen for the first time this past past august which was cool i watched these pack of wolves mess with this bear for about 45 minutes from two miles away it was neat so that's where that saying came from i was like huh if that if that one wolf was by itself and that bear got it cornered to be in trouble but this this three wolves just kind of walked as a group to kind of keep that bear spinning and they was playing with them and then they took off so it's uh it's good to help people and kind of build that community around you i believe so you mentioned I didn't know this, that you were homeschooled until your junior year. How hard was that to 
enter like a, the more, you know, like a regular school after being homeschooled for so long? Um, it was, it was interesting. I mean, I adapted pretty well. I, I, I usually pick up pretty quick on things. Uh, it was this, it was extremely different, I guess. Uh, I, I, I walked a lot as a kid. Uh, so I had jobs, you know, walking on farms, bucking square barrels, stuff like that. So I was, uh, I was used to like older people. I guess I would say so that most of my friends were older and then I went in the public school and now I'm trying to relate to kids that are my age but view the world differently than I do and my parents didn't let me watch like uh, any of like the, the today's shows I guess you could say I, like I watched Roy Rogers and John Wayne a lot and then uh, didn't let me play video games and at the time I was like why is my mom and dad let me play video games because I played traveling basketball like all my other friends play uh, video games and looking back now that was a, a blessing for me personally not saying there's anything wrong with video games but uh, it allowed me to put my time into other things. So how do you go from growing up in Missouri to becoming a hunting guide in Alaska? Yeah so interesting so from Two to eight, I was actually in Alaska. My okay. dad went to, went to Bible college up there. So I think that's where the, the mountain bug bit me. Because in at eight, we moved back to Missouri, which that's where my mom and dad were from. And I, I, I love Missouri. Missouri is great in its own right. But I had that mountain bug that bite, was biting me. So as soon as I got my driver's license, I started shooting out in my 97 Cavalier full bangle out to Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> a pile as many buddies as I could. And we would all split gas and <laughs> sit and play around on the mountains as long as we could. So uh, how that leads into like how I ended up back in Alaska, I was on a – a climbing trip when I was 17 and I see this white spot way off in the distance in these rocks. I'm like, what's that? So I take my, my cell phone and get up to it and it's a mountain goat. So I sneak into like 25 yards on it and poke my head up and get a selfie with it. And then <laughs> go back to climbing that 14 while I was climbing. Uh, and then that led into when I went to public school, I was a fortunate and they had an archery program there when I was, uh, some, some really phenomenal coaches there. I have to give them all the credit. Uh, I was able to pick that bow up and shoot very well on one state bow fields, went to nationals, did well on nationals, which sent me to the world tournament, which I ended up uh, tied with the world record. Me and this two kids both shot a 299 out of a 300. We went to shoot off. Uh, we shot tied again, shot tied again. So then we went to a, a sudden like whoever was closest to the bullseye wins and he got me by like an eighth of an inch uh which it's funny that i have these two big trophies in my hands and these black and my face looks like i i, like I just got smacked in the face i just like because <laughs> i hate losing i truly hate losing it's something that i as a personal problem i'm working on getting better with it <laughs> but uh I think it was meant to be that time because uh, his grandma just passed away like four days before that. So I think that, uh, I think he was meant to beat me, I, I believe, um, that day. So uh, it worked out. But that sent me to college on archery, that experience, doing that in high school. And then uh, the assistant archery coach daughter married an outfitter up in Alaska and they were looking for someone to come up and be what, what's called a packle. It's like more or less you do whatever you're told. Um, don't ask questions because if you if you do, then they won't sign off on your guide's license. You got to meet these requirements. So I did that, walked for free for a year um, and then uh, got my guide's license the following year. That's how uh, the Alaska guide uh, journey kind of came about. That's interesting. You said you worked for free for a year? Yes, yeah, so yeah, just just for tips. <laughs> no no <laughs> wages, no nothing. So um yeah. Did you have somebody that kind of is that where you learned? Had you always hunted prior to that, I guess, growing up? Um, I I started hunting at about the age twelve. Uh no one in my family hunts, so really how I learned to hunt was I, I was watching the Pursuit Channel. That's the main thing that I watch. And then uh, I finally talked to my mom into letting me get a bow. And how I got that bow was I went to an auction that a local Amish guy was having. And I bought up uh, a diamond that had like a, a diamond bow. And it had like the old style. It had like a pulley coming off the end of it. 
uh, so it had like a V bracket and then that cams, the rolly pins sat inside that V bracket. Uh, so that was my first bow and that's how I started hunting um, back when I was like 12. Okay, so you mentioned earlier, you're still fairly young. Yeah. How, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, how do you gain like the trust of somebody, you know, cause I, if you go on your website, some of the hunts that you take people on are fairly expensive. Mm-hmm. How do you gain the trust of what's probably many times an older general or an older person, you know, I, if they're going to spend a lot of their hard earned money. How do you gain that trust with them? Is it word of mouth? Is it like a, you just build up a client list or how does that exactly work? Yeah. So, so I'm a guy, not an outfitter. So how okay. I started out was, uh, so the outfitter will find a client and then the client will come on the hunt and then I get hired or subcontracted out as a guide to take that person out hunting in the field. So usually what, what would happen, especially in my early career, now I kind of have friends that are like repeat and they just kind of follow me around like, hey, we're going to hunt all sheep and I'll call my friend that is one of the best tall sheep outfitting operations. It's like, hey, you need to call this guy. He's interested. And from there, they work out the details and Riley's like, hey, they, you know, you want to come, come work for me this fall? Uh, I'm going to use a fake name. Billy just booked this sheep hunt. Uh, yeah, Billy's my buddy. Let's do it type of okay. video. So that's how it works out now. In the past, it was just like, I, you know, just starting out, didn't have a name, didn't have nothing. Uh, so how you build someone's trust is never never thinking you're above anything and this is like someone that's just like a smart individual not someone that has like an ego problem if you walk your tail off and truly care about that person they're gonna see that like people smell out fakeness but people also smell out realness so if you do your best and try your hardest and like truly break your back for that person they're gonna respect you and then once you have that respect, then then you go and then it's a team effort. It's like, hey, that's one thing. It's like when I take someone out in the field, I'm not like, I'm Mr. Shupo guy at Alaska and I've done this 50 times. You better listen to me. It's like, hey, this is your hunt. I'm the guy legally overall. I can like, you have to listen to me on like what we shoot and what we don't shoot. That way we don't get ourselves in the trouble because I have looked at a lot of these animals, but how we get there is going to be a team effort. Me and you are a team. We're going to treat it that way. I'm not your babysitter. You're not my babysitter. There's level of gun safety that needs to go into this. We need to be smart. This is Alaska. It can kill us very quickly and doesn't care. We're on the ocean. The ocean is going to, it's going to kill us. The, the water temperature right now is 38 degrees. We fall in, we got five minutes. We can't fall in. So we got to be smart. So it's like you, you kind of communicate all that information and by, Doing that in a, I like the confident but humble way, people respect that. And then if you have someone that's just uh, an unusual ego case, uh, I haven't met a client that's in that can walk with me in the mountains. So uh, <laughs> if you got to, t- <laughs> if you got, because you know you know, hunting takes a lot of walking. Will if someone's just an overly jerk, the weather. And it, I don't even always have to walk them into the mountain. A lot of times the weather will walk them into the mountain because it will start blowing and it will start being hard. And I'm used to it. I'll sit on the side of the mountain and be, you know, I'm not going to show any emotion. This is what it is. Let's go, let's go hunting. Well, they will start to like, why am I even here? Like, what, what are we doing? Like, this, this sucks. So Alaska is really good at humbling people, and it's humbled me many times. So. Well, and you bring up a great point. You know, I was asking about trust, you know, how do you gain their trust, but it's got to work conversely as well, where you have to trust them, you know, being in that environment and, you know, you're out with them. So you have to have some sort of mutual respect going between each other, I'd imagine. Oh, yeah. Most most of the time, like 99.9% of the time, there's only a few people that I've ever hunted with that it just we we didn't uh for whatever reason just didn't mesh but the majority of them you leave that hunt and you best friends like text all the time 
uh, keeping up with them. How's your wife? How's your kids? Uh, there's most of them are so phenomenal people that you just, you want them in your life and they care about you now because there's a, at the end of the day, Alaska is, especially when a storm comes through, I mean, there's the, the three threes, right? Three hours, three days, three weeks. So three hours of exposure. So you have exposure. You got to really watch out. But before that, you have three seconds and a bear will eat your ass really quick. And how you done. <laughs> so it's like you got to have, you know, accidents happen. So you got to like really, really build that trust. Like, hey, if something happens, this is what we're going to do. So like one thing I'll have a conversation with, if a bear does happen and it's full on, I don't need you drawing up your rifle behind me because now all of a sudden I have a rifle at the back of my head and then there's a bear here. That's not a good idea. If there is a bear charge and I yell, shoot them, like we need to put rounds in them because most of the time I just deal with the situation because most bears just bluff charge and run away. Uh, I've only had a couple of times where it's like, we, this thing's coming, like we need to do something. Uh, so I, I communicate. If this happens, this is what we are going to do. And we've run through it a few times. Dry fire practice is what I would equate it to. <laughs> I'm going to step right and you're going to step left. And I'm going to like more like step at an angle and you need to step forward so that muzzle's not going off in my ear. So you kind of just walk with that situation. Like this is how it's going to go down if this happens this is the way I'm going and this is the way you need to go. And if any, if I'm in the line of your sight, you should not shoot. It's just better for me to put that bear down. To, like it's just, that's just how it needs to go. So it's like communication. I, I guess all that long wordiness comes down to like communication with, uh, with the person you're with is how you start to build that trust and respect. And so like you've touched on it, you know, the Alaska is very unforgiving what are some of like the challenges, especially for like a first time hunter going to Alaska that you see that maybe people don't give enough respect to, you know, whether it be physical conditioning, you know, their gear or what are some of the different things that you see, some of the mistakes that you see people make when they make their first trip or even sometimes a follow up trip? Yeah, so I would say mistake wise is like not having the right rain gear um would be a big one uh you gotta have rubble so like kelly hansen grundens that's the kind of i got anything if if your rain jacket says breathable it's a great base layer like it's good for like hiking around but if you gotta sit on a spot knob for 18 hours looking for a barrel and it's raining non-stop and it's raining sideways uh, you're going to get wet no matter what you're in, but it's you definitely going to get wet in that jacket. So have some type of like rubble fishing-ish jacket that like most fishermen would use. Uh, I really like Sims. We're in Sims waders. Uh, that's what I usually run when I'm dealing with water because they make great uh, rain pants because you got that complete waterproof in this thing. So that would be a big one. Mental uh, preparation and firearm preparation. That Actually, that's the biggest mistake is firearm preparation. If, there's so many guys that you'll ask them to make a free-handed shot at 80 to 100 yards, and they look at like, what? And it's like most guys don't practice free-handed shooting. You have to practice free-handed shooting. You have to practice shooting from a seating position off the knee. You can't go to the range, shoot your gun, and then go to the range and shoot your gun. And right before a hunt, it'll shoot it off the bench, and that's the only type of practice you do. That doesn't equate to hunting in the mountains, hunting in the brush. You need to be able to shoot in different positions, calm your heart rate down, understanding like shooting structure and like building your base up. Uh, so I would recommend. Everyone, to, if, if they're going to go and do any type of hunt anywhere, go spend some money on a shooting class. If you have a thousand, if you have a $7,000 rifle and you haven't took any training course, you need to go sell that rifle, go buy a $1,000 rifle and go spend <laughs> five, six grand in training. And I could see where that would often be overlooked, you know, and I had to assume you know, even like then shooting under physical duress from the conditioning aspect of, you know, being in the elements that are you're exposed to up there. Does that come into play? I'd imagine it, it, it does. So I like, getting used to your gear. So I, I've 
played around with making some videos. I haven't done them quite yet. I've done a few like short clips. It's like you need to train with what your hunting gear setup is. So like I have a bino pouch that holds my binos here in front of my chest. I have a Glock G20 that's strapped next to that. So I have a decent amount of mass that's on my chest. So when I lay down the chute, if say I got a prone position, if I practice prone at home without that bino harness rig that I have on, it's not the same. Because that bino harness rig just makes my spine align differently from when I'm shooting on practice. So I got to fix that and I got to practice. There's that, there's that saying that practice prevents piss poor performance. So you got to practice how you're going to hunt. Because if you don't do that, all those little things that are small changes add up to a big deal when you're about to pull the trigger on something. So like, what is your like ideal client for somebody that wants to go? Is it somebody that's been there before or do you enjoy that first time, you know, that guy that's making his first uh, trip up there? I think it's a mixture. Uh, I don't really have an ideal client, just someone that wants to enjoy the experience of Alaska and treat it as like a learning lesson slash I want to see what Alaska is about versus someone that's just like, I have to kill the biggest bear on the mountain. And if I don't, I'm not happy. And inside my back of my mind, when I'm bear hunting, sheep hunting, whatever it is, that's my goal is I want to get the biggest animal on this mountain for this guy. But if, uh, if that's our main objective, then it turns the hunt into, it's, it's not, it's not enjoyable. If all, if all, the main kill is about killing an animal it's less enjoyable about hey look at that beautiful rainbow over there it's like there's someone that can take it all in and appreciate all like god's beauty that's right here in front of us while we're going to get a big animal type of a deal well and i've noticed like in you know obviously you have a successful youtube channel that you do um you know it seems like you take great care in like showing all those different elements, you know, like you were just describing, as well as making sure that you portray hunting in a very positive light. And I've heard you say before that you're very conscious or very aware of trying to be a role model for new hunters. Mm -hmm. One, why is that so important to you? And two, where do you see that sometimes that goes wrong with other people in the way it's portrayed? Yeah, well, I, I don't want to, pick on any other people but i think uh yeah and i'm, I'm not asking you like to name names or you know pick on anybody yeah. but just you know some of the things that i guess that you're very aware of making sure you're trying not to do yeah so it's it's what i see a lot in some editing um and some like hunting focus is that they get too caught up and this is a hunting show around killing this animal. No, so I guess it's it's just on your perspective. So my perspective is on filming these these hunts is I'm hunting, but what has this trip taught me about life? So those uh, I think it was episode four. That was a dip, difficult time in my life. Uh, had a buddy pass away by suicide. All that stuff was happening during that. Uh, during that time we made that episode during that hunt uh so instead of focusing on that circumstance i decided to focus on the lesson that it's taught me is that no matter where you because he had a this gentleman had a lot of good things going for him but he had a few things that were going really badly at that point in time in his life so in my mind i thought of it as like a mountain because i was doing some goat hunts you're going up a, a mountain goat hunting and it's really rough and there's a lot of brush and it's just pain in the butt it's real tough to get up there and you can be going up and you're going through thick stuff that's trying to chew you up and spit you back out the other side you can like hate life in that moment but if you stop do a one at 180 degree turn and look out you'll see some of the prettiest views you've ever seen in your life oh there's an ocean oh there's a big moose down there beneath us isn't that cool uh oh look at the way those ducks are sitting in that pond like it's just anything in life is like all about perspective so i think that's where i try to do it slightly different it's more about the lessons that come from hunting than it is about killing that animal uh, so I think that's a different way and why it's important to try to reach um, new people uh, 
it, it's it's more about reaching people in general. But the more people that we can bring into this industry, the longer it's going to be around. And hopefully, like not hopefully, we need to keep this around forever. So if if we continue to like get smaller, then all of a sudden you you no longer as powerful as you were if you had a big group going for you. So you got to bring people into the hunting industry so we can stay around. Same with gun industry all the way across the board. Why I kind of want to reach everybody is that I think we can all learn from those experiences. Uh, we have growth through through tough circumstances, and not everyone can can afford. I'm very blessed. Uh, through the job that I do to go on these crazy hunts all the time. Uh, so if I can capture the lessons and memories that I make on the on the mountain in these hunts and share them with other people so then they can kind of get a grasp of where I'm coming from when I do these things and why I view the world the way I view it, then maybe they can hopefully learn something from the experiences I've had. So I guess that's and maybe this comes from your upbringing, being around older people you mentioned earlier, but that's the one thing in talking to you a couple different times and meeting you down in South Carolina is you have like a very mature worldview or view of the world where, you know, and it seems like it's one that somebody much older would possibly have, you know, even in some of your writing that I've seen and different things. You know, you have a very philosophic way of looking at things. Is that something that like you learned from your parents or you just developed on your own? Or where does that come from at such a young age? Um, I, I think it's just been through uh, being blessed to experience different things. Uh, so I think part of it's that I grew up around an older generation. But what I, I credit a lot to, uh, to Alaska and the situations I've been in. I've had several different like close calls in my life. Uh, when I was 19, I, I was running up this river, cutting out log jams so we could get up the following week. The outfitter could get up. This was back when I was a packer. I couldn't guide people, so I just did whatever whatever I was told to do. So I was doing probably about a two, two man job, at least probably three man job. Um, and not having any experience on doing it. And I was running up this, uh, this, the Chena river, cutting out the log jams. And anyways, I was getting this one out and there was tension on the log. And I, I couldn't, I didn't know how to read the river or how the logs just kind of weave in together every which way. And I was cutting this one and I was thinking it was just going to drop off, but it had tension on it. So when it, and I was kind of dumb because I was I had to have the boat on half throttle to keep up with the current, and uh, so so the the motor's running, going with the current, and then I have one leg kind of like draped over this log, and one leg draped around the the side of the boat to kind of keep it stable. And I'm cutting away, and again I'm 19, so this sounds extremely dumb. It was I should have been like, <laughs> no, uh, it needs two guys. We need two guys to do this safely. One guy can't do it. Uh, but I wanted to prove myself and look super cool. So I was like, I'm, yeah, I got this. So I cut that log, uh, pops up and hits the bow of the boat because there was tension on it, pinches the, the saw, the saw stuck in the log. Uh, and I know that because after I, I got the situation dealt with, I went and took the other chainsaw and cut a little bit more to get the chainsaw out. But when it bucked, it kicked me like off the boat so there i am and if you know anything about a river and how a log jam it's like got a downward sucking pull and i had hip waders so i remember going on the water looking up and this is going to sound like kind of weird but i remember uh almost like looking at myself from a third person it was weird it was like i had a drone like video on it because that's how my mind remembered it <laughs> and i remember and then cut I remember looking up and seeing the light, uh, like not as the light that I'm about to die, but as like the water is here, my head's on the water and thinking like, wow, this is going to be tough on my mom. <laughs> and then luckily I, I, I was, I think it was God. It wasn't my time for my ticket to be punched. Uh, but I was, I, I did a lunge like this and my foot hit something. I don't know if it was a, another log or that would happen to be the bottom. Uh, it looked really deep where it happened at. So I think it somehow I just got lucky and it hit a log and I popped back up and on my left, my left hand, these two fingers caught the, the front cleat on the 16 foot jet boat. The cleat was 
uh, sideways so you tie it off a little bit easier and stuff like that when you tie it off to the bank and it caught that cleat and I was able to grab I got my arm on it and then the boat hit uh, the back of something so my head bounced off the boat uh, but anyways I was able to get back in the, you know it started washing around get back in the boat and I was fine I remember after that I kind of changed my perspective on like uh, how when I was younger I had a big uh superman syndrome i guess you could say i could do anything and nothing could hurt me that's just how i was how i thought uh and then that situation kind of like wow i was real close to getting my ticket punched uh and it's like there's a saying i forget who said it but we should uh begin with the end in mind because the end is going to come like all our tickets get punched whether when we 90 or 100 or when we 10 like there's a lot of people that pass away really young so it's, we never know when that's going to happen so living with a, a deeper level of of understanding i would say is is good like you don't want to be naive i guess and i think that's important not to be naive and i think you know you touch on something when we're 19 we feel like we're invincible mm-hmm. and you know, most of us have never been through an experience like what you had there. So I had a lot of different questions as you were telling that story. One, like, what's the, you know, I assume the water temperature is extremely frigid when this is going on. And two, it's, were you as calm when this all happened as the way you just told that story? <laughs> um, was it like a panic or, you know, because you mentioned that it went through your mind. This is going to be hard on my mom. Yeah. I, I never really like when it was all over, I never really got that panicked. I don't know if it's just something, something I have weird about me. I don't, I usually don't get like panicky. Do you think uh, that maybe helped save your life by not panicking? I, I would say so. So like if you panic, all you're doing is like making the situation way worse. Uh, so it's kind of like a, so I do MMA and Jiu Jitsu. The minute you panic, you're done. Uh, if you stay calm, think through your situation at minimum, you're going to last longer before you get submitted or knocked out or get caught in the face. Uh, panicking is the enemy of everything. Like you talk to like really good, like drivers, uh, if they stay calm, they can usually handle like them sliding out or something like that. If you if you panic when you start losing grip on your rear wheel and start joking the steering wheel, it's game over. So it's just staying calm is crucial with anything that you do. Whether you're tracking a wounded brown bear and it starts to charge you, brown bear charges you, he's running 35 miles an hour at you. If you panic and forget how to sack your, your weapon and stuff, you you're going to get messed up. Well, if you stay calm, like this bear's running at me, but I got two shots in it. Bang, bang. I mean, military guys know this better than I do. They have to probably have a higher volume of situations like that. They've had to go through. They have a, their enemy combat force and that's in front of them. If they panic, now that they just gave that force an edge, well, if they just like, bam, it's, it's game over. So it's like, you got to stay calm in situations. Much easier said than done from hearing it on this side. <laughs> <laughs> the So along those same lines, I know you end up traveling a lot for your line of work. You know, whether it be, you know, when we met, you were kind of in the middle of doing a lot of different trade shows and on the road nonstop. And then when I, when you go out on these hunts and, guy, you know, when you're guiding, you're gone for extended periods of time. How do you try to maintain that balance between like your home family life against your work life? Um, I just try to give my best effort with everything. Uh, and I probably could do a better job with some, with, uh, with balancing everything. Cause it's always, you got to grow as you, as you experience more things you need to adjust. Uh, so whenever I get a chance, uh, I run out and see my mom and dad. So I'm back in Missouri at the moment. So I'll, I'll go see my mom and dad, spend a lot of time with my girlfriend. Uh, but all that happens, like, I st I'm still working like eight hours, 10 hours a day at minimum. Uh, so I, I got that side scheduled out. And then after that, 
uh, it's okay to run wide open, especially when you're young, I think. is like, okay, you go do so like Saturday this weekend. I'm going to go to a reunion with my with my family, and it's way up two hours north of where I'm at. And then tonight, at that, that Saturday night, I have a the guy that trains me, a really cool guy, Nathan. He's he's taking an MMA fight. Well, I want to be there to support him, so I'm going to drive three hours to Kansas, watch his fight, and then drive the two and a half, three hours back to Springfield to go to church with my girlfriend. So it's like you you can get a lot done. You just got to be willing to do it. And I think that's the main thing is like just every opportunity that you have, if it's like don't get yourself in a bad situation, but if there's an opportunity that pops up, make it happen. Don't be like, oh, well, if I didn't have to drive two hours, then I, then I could. It's like, Fucking two hours, drive it. Like, just take take your opportunities and try to do as many as you that you can, because those little memories. It's like uh, I had this guy named JD. He was actually rise up episode number one. He's like, uh, pack your life full of memories and experiences, because when you're on your deathbed, that's what you got to look back on. And he's like, those micro memories, those. Uh, I'm going to call them medium memories and those big memories. And he's like, uh, those big memories are going on a bear hunt in Alaska. The medium memories are like graduating college, like some of, like some of those type of things. And then micro memories are spending time with your family, watching your wife uh, get up in the morning and you guys having a cup of coffee together. Like all those little memories. He's like, if you can pack as many of those memories in, you're going to have a good life. And I think, uh, this is I don't watch a ton of TV. I think TV's uh a, a mount, like a good amount of entertainment's good. So it's like it's kind of kind of productive because I'm producing a show, but I'm like don't watch too much of it because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know of any movie that I sit back like at, in ten years. I don't think I'm gonna look back on a movie that I watched this year and be like, wow, I'm glad I did that. I don't think it's going to happen, but there's going to be times and days that I go out fishing with my dad, dates I go with my girlfriend, time I spend with my mom that I imagine one day I'm going to look back and like, I'm glad I did that. So I think that is an absolutely wonderful way to look at it. And, it, you know, so many times we hear people who they don't have time to do this or they don't have time to do that, but then you'll discuss any Netflix series or, TV show and they've watched every episode or they've watched all four or five seasons, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. you know? So I think it, to your point, it's kind of like, what do you want to make a priority Mm -hmm. and what is important? You know, like you said, 10 years from now, what are you going to remember? It's not going to be that you watched, you know, whatever popular series was on Netflix at the time. Mm -hmm. It's going to be that time you spent with your dad, be that time, you know, you spent with your, girlfriend or mom or whatever it might be. So I think that's a super cool perspective to have that we can all learn from. And it kind of, the the one thing that I've noticed too, in talking to you is that you're obviously a very driven person. You know, you're doing the guiding things, you know, doing the YouTube channel, a whole bunch of different stuff. But then you're also, you know, very entrepreneurial with working on some other stuff. One that you mentioned off camera that we can't talk about yet, <laughs> but then you are we're also working on another app. Where does, I, I want to know more about that app, but prior to that, where does like this entrepreneurial spirit, have you always been that way? Um, or is it just that same mindset of, you, you know, we got to pack in as much as we can while we're here. I think I- I think I've always had a level of it, um, not the entrepreneurial spirit, just like a, a high, a high will to put a high output out. So like I used to run all the time. I'd probably run like four hours, five hours a day when I was a kid in high school because I needed that energy to go somewhere. I don't know <laughs> where, where it comes from. Um, so now I I still like walk out a lot, but I don't walk out as much as I used to because now I have these other things to keep me. Um, distracted, and I think it came from is uh, I want to start this off. I love my mom and dad to death, best people. I, I couldn't ask for any better parents. But uh, we grew up 
relatively poor. Uh, and I remember getting told we can't afford that a lot. Um, and I remember like saying to myself at a young age is that one day when I have kids, I would tell them yes or no, but I won't say we won't, we can't afford that. Uh, and that's just something that I, I said to a young age. So that's kind of where I think the, the entrepreneurial spirit comes from is like, I'm going to, I'm going to work very hard. Did that ever give you like an unhealthy relationship with money? Always uh, hearing that we can't afford that. And I, not really. I don't think. Okay. I would say uh, for a little bit of time um, when I started making, because I got a job at a, a relatively young age, uh, so I would say I, I blew that money on on material things. So I would say from fourteen to eighteen to nineteen, I uh, I misused money. I used it as more of like. Look at all the things that can buy me, um, and then all like kind of the paycheck, the paycheck type of mentality. Uh, that that if you're in that situation, that it's that it's bad. But I think uh, if you can get to a place where uh, you don't need money, because uh, it's kind of interesting. And I I don't have a lot of money as of right now, but uh, I have a lot of things going. But the guys that I do know that have a lot amount of money and what I would consider wealthy because they have their family in check as well. Like they have a good relationship with everyone is, uh, they don't, they don't view money as that they need it. They view it as a tool. It's a, it's a tool and the arsenal, uh, and they make it work for them. They don't have any emotional reaction. If they see a pile of cash, they don't have emotional reaction. Like, Oh, I want that. And I think, uh, that's, when the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, I think that's where it comes from is because uh, you start it, you start the, the long for it instead of viewing it for what it is. And I think that's important to view it for what it is. It's a tool. It's an ends to a means. Um, it's, at the end of the day, it's not that important, but it's, it's handy to have. Uh, so I know that I went down a little bit of a rabbit trail on no, that. But, but I think – you know, you bring up an excellent point because I know there's people that I've heard talk or that I know that are extremely wealthy. And they said, you know, the biggest mistake is that people think once they get a certain number in the bank, they're going to instantly, it's going to bring them happiness. Yeah. It doesn't happen. And, and they said that doesn't happen because one, you're always chasing them that next number. Mm -hmm. So if that's what you think is going to make you happy, that'll never happen. Mm hmm. And there's uh, Jordan Peterson. Um, I, I've read some of his books, and uh, I draw some inspiration from him. And he says, uh, how does he say, it? that it's not happiness that you should be striving for. It's uh, meaning. And I think he got a lot of what he says from a guy named uh, Victor Frankl. Uh, he wrote uh, Man, Shorts, and Meaning. He was a Holocaust survivor. Excellent book. Oh, it's if if you're listening to this, uh, you need to go like buy or read or listen to that book. Like, it's I think it should be required reading um, for Americans. It just it gives you a, a great insight to to life, I believe. Uh, but he he talks a lot about it. Is that it's uh if if you look for happiness, happiness is short like you how can you find happiness in a concentration camp everything that you love everything you you all you have left is your naked existence he says that several times throughout that book but why were some of the people able to escape the holocaust or auschwitz um with the sense of dignity in themselves intact and that's that's comes from a, uh, a shorts for meaning you drive you your f main focus in life is meaning how do you make them how do you impact the most people and what I, I, i'm kind of at a loss forward and trying to think how to articulate myself but if you're looking at yourself how do i promote myself how do i do that then it, you're almost striving for happiness and i think meaning comes from what comes out more than what comes in so i think that's a and that's an entrepreneurial trick too because if you look at how how do i make money you should be like viewing it as how do I fix all these other people's problems and then money is going to follow. Uh, so it's kind of like, a, I guess I would call it a law. If you're looking at bringing stuff in, it might not work out as planned. But if you're looking on how you get stuff out, 
It's like import export. You want to be exporting as much as you can. You know, and kind of to circle back when you have a client out on a hunt, you know, you even talked about it. I want, you know, I want that person to see all of Alaska, you know, see the beauty of what it is. You know, there, there's so much more than just that hunt, you know, that they're on. Mm-hmm. And I and I think that back to your point on the entrepreneurial spirit is if you can make people feel good or solve a problem that they may have, the money will always come in at some point. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, the one interesting thing since we were on that book that I that I found interesting is he talks towards the end. Many of the people that survived, once they got out, he's like, you would think they'd be super happy and relieved that they've escaped some of the horrors that we can't even fathom. Mm-hmm. He said, but they thought then they were owed something. Yep. So they thought, you know, they didn't have to respect the people that didn't have to go through what they went through, which I found very interesting with what then he did is he was trying to, you know, even after everything he went through, he wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. uh, Yeah. Cause I, I, I'm actually like listening to the book for the third time. Cause I'm trying to comprehend as much as I can of it. And it's, it's interesting how like human nature play in plays out again and again and you can see it in several other different places on like their urge to not care about anything because of the, what they went through and how he talked about how you have to have a higher root in something a higher belief in humanity or god or whatever i don't want to get in getting too deep on that because i know everyone believes different things but uh how, if you're not rooted in a higher calling how easy it is to look inside yourself and just see what you deserve instead of seeing what the right thing is. And it was interesting because in that book he talks about, I'm going to, I don't remember what he calls them at the top of my head, but, uh, so you have the Gestapo and then you have the Jews that worked for the Gestapo inside the camp because then they could get higher like rations and stuff. And I can't remember what he called them. Um, but how those people, would sometimes be way more harsh and evil than the the Gestapo, the, the the Germans that were in charge of that, because then by doing that they would get more more rations, more alcohol, whatever they were get given. And it's interesting to see because as soon as you let go of your higher root and and like the laws of how you should live and what I, I believe is biblically based on like the Ten Commandments and how you should treat people, it's easy to go down a dark and evil path really quick just to get uh, what you want or what you need. So, uh, And I think you're 100% spot on there. So I'm going to digress a little bit. I don't know. You know, back to, you know, we started going down that rabbit hole talking about the entrepreneurial spirit and different things, Mm -hmm. you know, and even, how do I want to phrase this question? You know, I guess how, how did you get into, you're developing an app that helps Mm -hmm. people, but how did you get into that given the, what you've been doing, you know, for the last several years? Yeah, so uh, honest answer, just extremely blessed. Uh, a, a gentleman I guided was in the software industry, has done extremely well in the software industry. Like he's got a B behind his name. I won't say his name. Uh, and it goes back to like if you have a strong worth ethic, excuse me, and you don't complain and you're willing to do anything, uh, the people that appreciates those characteristics will notice. And they would try to help you out, um, I guess is how I put it. So more or less, he's like, hey, this, you know, I love your work ethic. What's going on? Um, you know, you, you should come hang out at my place in Texas. Okay, cool. And, it, you know, you build up a, a friendship. And those guys are extremely intelligent. And uh, so they don't just, like, show all the hand of the cards. But if you continue to show up, because that's it's one thing that, People will put on like a, let's say a job interview. They'll go to a job interview wearing the best suit, ready to attack the day, 
got the best self on. But as soon as I get the job, after the first two months, that best suit kind of goes away. And it's important not to lose that. You got to show up. It's like what you did yesterday does not matter. Don't give a crap about it. It's what, what are you going to do today? And if you have that attitude, uh, that's when you get stuff done. So long story short, that guy just kind of through a, a period of time opened my eyes to how that business works in software. Uh, and that's how these companies have come about is just by looking at what he did, studying how he made it, how, how it's important to figure out how to make a scalable product, one that can infinitely grow versus let's say guiding i'll use guiding for example i I only have so many days in a year and that caps what i can do and i can try to go find a couple other guys that do it underneath me but it's still it's very capped i can only go out so big well something like software if you develop a truly good product which i believe i have it can grow very quickly once you get in front of people and You've been very fortunate, like you just said, to be around some very successful people and be able to learn through them. Mm -hmm. And I'd imagine when you're out on these hunts that at night, you know, you're able to just learn the way they think, the way they carry themselves, you know, the way they view business, all these different things that a lot of people probably pay a lot of money to be able to be mentored or get that same access of information. Mm hmm. No, m most definitely. It's that's why I say it's like uh, I am incredibly blessed. Like it's it's not me um, at whatsoever. I, I want to me personally. I want to give credit to God and then the people that God's put into my life. And then I just try to uh, do the most with all the good things God has given me. It's like uh, there's a uh, God brings you things, but he he expects. I believe he expects you to take action upon those things. I just want to make that clear that uh, I, I'm not just like handed a golden cake in my lap. It's like, well, here's your the flour. Here's your this. Here's your that. Here's your that. And I go freaking buy a cookbook and figure out how to put it together. <laughs> That's how I kind of would, would, would yeah. describe it. It's like you got to put you got to put effort in behind it. So, uh, no, I, I'm very blessed to have well, the and, friends I have. And I think you've proven that over and over again. You know, I think you mentioned it was 10 months that you worked without pay. Yes, yeah, so yeah, <laughs> a little you know, bit, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's it's all things that, you know, like you said, you've been put in some very good situations, but I think you have to give yourself a lot of credit that you put yourself in some of those situations. You are willing to work without pay. You are willing to start at the bottom, you know, willing to do the work that nobody else wanted to do. And through that level of hard work, that persistence, and doing things the right way and treating people the right way, is how you've ended up being in the situations that you've been able to be in. No, I, I, I don't want to take too much credit, but it goes back to the mindset and you showing up and realizing that. So I'll, I'll pick an example, and this is not me trying to toot my own horn, but uh, I was out at camp this spring, and there was a nasty job that needed to be done. It was dumping a sewage bucket. Well, I, I've passed... I've gotten beyond well, like that would technically be my job to do anymore because uh, I'm not not the bottom man on the totem pole anymore. But I volunteered for that job uh, because it's important to uh, – because I have an ego problem. I do. Like I, I, I got to keep it in check. So it's important to like uh, – to keep like to be very conscientious when success starts to come, not to stop doing the things that got you to where you're at now. So whether that's proactively doing jobs that you've kind of already technically moved past, just to make sure that why you're carrying that sludge bucket full of shit is what it was. Excuse my language, but you, that's what you're doing. You can think that how lucky I am to be in this situation that I, I've passed this, but yet I realize that I'm not above anything because um, it's important to make yourself have that perspective because it's easy to, to, to lose that. So proactively do stuff that keep you from losing it, I guess. And I would have to imagine those are some of the little things that 
some of these super successful people watch and see, you know, they're obviously not there to watch you carry that bucket. They're there, you know, to be guided on their hunt. But when they see that you're willing to do whatever it takes to make their hunt successful and to make things work, I would think just naturally then, you know, that gives them a trust and respect respect factor when they want to, you know, help you out with other endeavors, you know, kind of like that uh, app you're developing. Mm, I think it does. It, it goes into like what your true motive is. And we as humans, we are extremely gifted that we can decide what our motives are. And if, uh, if your motive is to do something just, uh, just to get this next opportunity, then it's going to come off weirdly. But if your motive is to do this action because it's the right thing to do and whatever happens after that will happen, then people notice that too. So it's like you got to, attentions are a huge, huge thing. And that's where like we as humans have got to make sure attentions and that is in the right spot. Cause sometimes my attentions get in the wrong spot and I'll, I'll be going through this motion to get X and it's like, wait a minute, why am I doing this? Because I know by, if I do that and I, I do it, I catch myself doing it all the time is like, that is going to show that's a side of myself that I don't want to have. Like, I don't want to be manipulated. Like you, 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 in business, you need people to do certain things. But if you being nice for the strict reasons to get X done, that's not right. You should be nice. And then through being nice, it's, it's going to sound kind of goofy because they're very similar. But the attentions make it totally different when you get down to the root of it. Is that so, so if you're just nice to this person because you want X done. But yet you don't give the person the attention on the street while you walk by them. That's a bum. Those, those, uh, your niceness is not rooted in your core. It's rooted in manipulating people, if that makes sense. I'm not doing a good job of, of describing it. But. but I think you're exactly right. You have to give without the expectation of anything in return. Mm-hmm. Because you're 100% spot on that so many people – they give, but they're, even if they don't willingly say it in the back of the, their mind, they're always like, how can this benefit me? Or what, what's this going to do for me if I do this? Mm-hmm. Yep. And people, people see, see through that. And I had a coach one time tell me, he goes, if, he's like, if you really want to see how that, if that's how you operate, do an act of kindness, whatever it is you know, like whether it's a donation or whatever, but he's like, you can't tell anybody that you did it. Mm -hmm. And on the surface, it seems very easy, but I've done that several different times. And I'm almost ashamed to admit that one of the first things you want to do is tell somebody that you did this. Mm -hmm. And it, it's been a, something that I've learned from, you know, and learned a lot about myself through the process of trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you, uh, and I don't want to get too, too biblical, um, but that's kind of what my belief is structured around is that uh, it says uh, when you give, don't let the right hand know what the left hand's doing or however it's worded, it might yes. be the opposite from that. And I, there's a lot of truth because that's where true giving is found. And I'm not even close to that. You know what I mean? It's like, I got, it's a, it's, and that's an important thing that I think to note is that if you're not where you want to be today, it's not okay, but it's to be expected. And you need to walk. Maybe you can't get from – you can't – so say let's use walk out because that's an easy example. You can't go from never walking out to benching 315 for a set of five typically unless if you're just some monster. You're an average Joe. It's going to be a long process to get to that point, and that's it's. A, I think it's the same way with our inner attentions. Is that you, I think you can manipulate what you what you think inside your mind and the tension as you do it. It just might take some time to get to the point where you where you're at that point. So if you feel like, well, crap, I I do 
all these things. I, I'm just nice to the people that I need things from. Well, the fact that you realize that that's the case is a good starting point. Yes. Now you should start to weed that out. And it's just like you said, it's like working out where it's almost like a muscle that you have to put in repetitions of doing it. Mm-hmm. It's you not going to come, you know, it's not going to come overnight. It's not going to be quick, but you know, I think if you slowly try to do that each day, you can look back in 30, 60 or 90 days and see substantial progress. No, definitely. It's any, anything that's most, anything that's truly worth doing takes time. I believe so. I agree with you. So circling us all the way back around to your hunting before we close, cause we've been going about an hour is two questions. Mm-hmm. What has been your most challenging hunt and what has been your favorite hunt? Um, the most challenging hunt, uh, it, it was, uh, I don't know. That's tough. Um, can can we categorize it? Can we go yes. mentally or physically? Because those are two different answers. Since we've done so much on the mindset and the mental side of things, let's go mentally. Mentally, okay. Uh, it, it was actually a hunt that uh, wasn't uh, successful because of the circumstances. It was when my buddy passed away uh, due to the like it was due to suicide. I would just call it what it was, and. Uh, at that point, usually it's like always I'm I'm in on hunting. Let's freaking do it. Let's walk the gate. When that happened, uh, I didn't have – like I did not want to go hunting. But I went, we went ahead and did three more days of hunting. And my, the hunter was a, such a phenomenal man. I use his false name, Ryan. Uh, he, he seen where my mind was at. Uh, and like I was still going through the motions. I'm like, you know, let's, let's do this. Uh, but inside, I was like, this this, this sucks. Because it kind of puts out it, – it's another thing that death puts things in the perspective. Uh, and then it's tough to keep uh, to keep mentally focused on something like that. So I get my hats go off to the people that are in the military that lose lose close friends and have to go back out the next day. And it was, uh, that was the most mentally challenging because it was like, this is my job that I need to do. I'm going to still do it, but having that, uh, you just, you just don't, you don't want to do it. You, you doing it and you doing it to the best of your ability, but you don't want to do it. It's, it's a weird feeling. I never, I've actually never felt that before. It's like, I don't want to freaking do this. Like, why am I doing this? And you start to question everything in life. Um, so finishing that out, luckily Ryan was like, Hey man, let's just get out of here. So he chartered an airplane into where we we're hunting at paid paid for it and got us out of there um which was awesome the the weather was complete crap so the moose won't move in um because it just the area has been over hunted in that area with the guy i was walking for that was the same the guy that left me out on the mountain for a month that was the same, same guy so it was just a fiasco after fiasco type of thing uh so that that was the most challenging uh mentally was was that one uh like I don't really know how to describe it and articulate it. It was just, I didn't want to do it, but still making yourself do something that you truly, you just don't know why you're doing it at that point in time. And and I think that makes sense that, you know, with the way you described it before, the one thing you enjoy about the hunt so much is being present, you know, in the situation. And it's probably almost impossible to be present given those circumstances. Yeah, it, it was, and that that was a that was a tough deal. Cause uh, I'll go ahead and talk about it, cause maybe someone um, is going through something si- like similar uh, at this point in time. Is that I was the only uh, friend out of that out of his friends that he talked about being depressed about, and uh, I figured that you know he's he's a hunting guy just like I am. You know, hey dude, just tuck your chin, keep going, you'll get through it. Uh, and and then obviously he didn't um he tapped out and i struggled with it for a while and then uh i talked to actually a psychiatrist i don't think it's it's bad to go get help if you if you really struggle with something and she was like well what could have you like what could have you done differently I'm like well i could you know 
took him to a hospital or something. Well, she was like, well, what happens when uh, when you do that? And I was like, I don't know. I haven't been through this before. She's like, well, they get put on a suicide watch or whatever whatever you would call it. Excuse me, I just spilled that. And uh, she's like, so put on a suicide watch, you can't have a firearm, so therefore they no longer to do what they're going to – what what they do in their livelihood. So if you would have did that, would he have been in any of a better position than what he was when that happened? And you think about it, you think, mm, probably not. He probably wouldn't have been happy if he was locked in a room knowing the guy, he could have, you know, figured out a different way. So it's like w- when things happen, sometimes there's not always a, a clear cut answer and you just got to look at it for what it was and hindsight's always 2020 and you have to live and you got to focus on the things that you can control because what's in the past is in the past you you can't I mean you can't change that stuff so how how am I gonna move forward to make anything I come in contact better than what it was before I got there because whatever happened back there is back there you can't get back to it anymore so i don't know <laughs> no, no i think that's a great perspective and it kind of you know goes along with what i opened the podcast with about like on your website of you know trying just to be better you know tomorrow than you were today mm-hmm. and that's all we can you know really do it is when it is. Caleb, this has been, I've really enjoyed this. I didn't know we were going to cover some of the topics we did and I'm, but I'm so glad we did. This has been awesome. Where can people, a couple different things, where can people find you, your YouTube channel, and then tell us what the new app is that you've been developing that is currently out there. Okay, absolutely. So uh, if they want to find me, uh, you can just type in my name. It's Caleb, C-A-L-E-B, and then Stillians is S-T-I-L-L-I-A-N-S. You can just type that in the Google, and it's going to pop up all the information. Um, it's going to pop up my YouTube as well. But if you want to look up the YouTube uh, specifically, it's Rise Up with Caleb Stillians. If you type in Rise Up with Caleb, it's going to pop up. Uh, on on the app side of things, so it's called Tappity. Um, Tappity is a, a a way to share contact info, and then it's got a, a app on the back end, so you can manage that info. You can set up a group just like you would like with Instagram. You can post stuff on there. You can organize. Uh, so say I have a let's use so on for example. Uh, if they had a winner strong group, they can put all those people inside that group underneath their main group, which is Soren. So you can manage your different contact groups through the app. But what's cool, like this on like a 10,000 foot, 50,000 miles an hour over top of it, is that if I'm at a trade show and I want to give you my contact info, all I got to do is take this little business card shape or this button that's on the back of my phone or a sticker. There's a lot of different tools that we have them on and tap it on the top of your iPhone and it's going to pull up this tab and you hit save the contacts and auto fills all of my contact information straight into your phone. So what used to take minutes and hopefully they typed your name in right now it takes a matter of three seconds of tapping two buttons and it's in there. And, and the neat thing that you were showing me is you can kind of control the information you know, it's more than just what would be on a business card. It could be video links or what, whatever it is you're trying to either promote or want them to be aware of. Mm-hmm. The one question I had as you were showing that to me, is there any, like, everybody seems like they're worried about security and privacy right now. Is there any risk of anything like that being breached when you go through that process? No, no, there's not. Uh, and what you put in front is is all on you. Like you don't have to put any sensitive information on there. So it's like if you're uncomfortable with people having your cell phone number, uh, don't don't put it type of a deal. So like whatever you decide to put to the public, that's that's on you. It's not on us. Like Tappity is providing a platform where you the like customer can get the consumer your information that you want them to none of the your personal information goes out it's all about what you select that you want to go out to the public 
Well, that's awesome. And, and you can set up custom buttons. So what I like to use it with is that I have, you know, my show, uh, my website, and then I have a tab that join the newsletter. So I can have, join this newsletter, say someone was like, hey, I'm thinking about going hunting. I'd like to know more about it. Well, maybe I don't, this is going to sound terrible, but I only have so much bandwidth. So I really don't want them touching, like texting me all the time because uh, I just don't have time to get back to everybody like on questions like that. Uh, so I can be like, here, join the newsletter so I could use my, my generic call that I don't have my contact information with. And then now they can get updates through, through email lists that I send out. So you can go to your email list like that. So it's not just about giving your contact info, your personal contact info. You can give out your business contact info and grow that list uh, quickly and more efficiently now. I look forward to checking that out and look forward to hearing more from you because you are a very fascinating individual that has a tremendous amount of depth to you for being such a young guy. Um, You know, very impressive. I, I appreciate you taking the time tonight to join us. Yeah, I thank you guys for listening. And if you ever have any questions or suggestions, hit us up at podcast at volkortson.com. Thank you for having me. So it was a, it was a true pleasure. And uh, I, I appreciate all the listeners for taking their time to, to listen to me ramble on. So hopefully it wasn't I think, too bad. I think they'll appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.